Mrs. Thatcher. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government. <laughs> the timing of the motion, Mr. Speaker, arises from the Government's inept handling of the results of the referendum on the Scotland and Wales Acts. When we thought it was a time for decision, the Prime Minister thought it was a time for talks. As he'd previously spurned them, we were not wholly convinced that the reasons he advanced represented the whole truth. <laughs> and we were similarly skeptical when he expressed his willingness to consider modifications to the present act, presumably by an amending bill, or a totally different measure. From his days as Home Secretary, we know that the right honourable, ta honourable gentleman takes what might be charitably described as a flexible view of constitutional niceties. <laughs> but even he might find it difficult to arrange for major changes on a subject like this to pass through all their stages in the three working months at most which are left to this House. Any such changes must be for a new Parliament. The only decision the Prime Minister really took was to delay a decision and for reasons which I find difficult to understand, Mr. Speaker, such momentous delays seem these days to be accompanied by a ministerial broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> the good government of the United Kingdom and its unity is a matter of supreme importance to this House wherever we may sit. The new proposals are not for a dying Parliament, but for a new one. Mr. Speaker, the essence of the motion this afternoon is that the government has failed the nation, that it's lost credibility, and that it is time for it to go. Yeah. Unless the Prime Minister should advance his customary explanation of failure, namely his political inheritance, may I point out that his and this government's inheritance was from a Labour government led by the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Heighton. This Parliament was elected in October 1974. By then, Labour had been in office for seven months. They had plenty of time to assess the economic state of the country. The election of October 1974 gave them the opportunity to state it clearly. They did. The Chancellor claimed inflation was down to 8.4% on his chosen basis. Later, when it went soaring up, how did he explain it? Not by any talk about the previous Conservative government's policies. That excuse hadn't been invented. On BBC Radio 4 analysis in October 1976, the Chancellor said, I think it's fair to say that inflation went up much more after the October election than I or anyone else expected, because the trades unions didn't at the time observe the social contract as they defined it earlier in the year. Indeed, when the Chancellor was pressed, he stressed the point and went even further. I think it's fair to say, he said, that wage inflation was the main reason for the runaway inflation in the months that followed the October 1974 election. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nor was it only inflation that had been beaten by October 1974, according to the then government. The Chancellor said on the 24th of September, after six months in office, I am certain we can get through the whole of next year with well under a million unemployed. Not only did he not get through 1975 with under a million unemployed, he did not get through 1976 or 1977 or 1978. So it's no good the Prime Minister now saying that the disasters since October 1974 were the fault of the Conservative government. In October 1974, the Labour government took full responsibility for the state of the economy. But then, of course, Mr. Speaker, 
Let us be fair to the previous Prime Minister. He was prepared to take responsibility. But let us take the Prime Minister's own objectives as the tests by which he should be judged. He set them out in the first censure debate, which took place in June 1976. His first objective was to overcome inflation. Apparently, the Chancellor of the Exchequer had not performed that feat by the time the last election took place. Be that as it may, the fact is that this government has been responsible for doubling the prices in the housewife's shopping basket. Now, far from being overcome, inflation is rising again and will rise for the coming months. Indeed, on the Healy basis, it is already into double figures. And it was on that basis that the Treasurer gave us the figure, 13.3%. The Prime Minister's second objective was to make inroads into the unacceptably high level of unemployment and to reduce it by 1979 it's in 1976, to 3%. Today it is double that figure. On that too, the Prime Minister has failed. And his third objective, to achieve a high output, high productivity, high wage economy, based on full employment. But only a week or so ago, we had news of the worst level of manufacturing output this decade. And a few days ago, we had a chilling reminder that not only are our industrial competitors ahead of us in output, but they are pulling away from us at what seems an ever faster rate. For every extra unit of output from a worker in British industry over the last five years, our least efficient competitor, the Italians, produced two, the Americans more than three, the French four and a half, the Germans five and a half, and the Japanese more than six. In the same world conditions as we face, their governments seem to be able to generate the conditions for success. Yeah, 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 yeah. This government has failed. Those were the Prime Minister's objectives. His strategy was the social contract, and then a new social contract, to enable us to proceed with confidence in the years ahead. That strategy has totally collapsed, as many of us thought it would, but we were regularly vilified for saying so. The fourth phase of that contract, the 5%, was never accepted by those for whom it was intended. It resulted in creating the very confrontation that the Prime Minister boasted he had replaced by cooperation. And the people witnessed the spectacle of a government abdicating its authority to strike committees. So the Prime Minister's objectives were not achieved and his strategy failed. Had his dream of new economic strength come about, the Prime Minister said he would use it to strengthen our position abroad, to ensure a peaceful solution to world problems through the use of the United Nations, and to strengthen Europe's voice. And the reality, rarely in the post-war period can our standing in the world have been lower or our defenses weaker. The international position is graver than at any time since the 1930s. The difference is that Britain is now a nation on the sidelines. In one diagnosis, however, I agree with the Prime Minister. Influence overseas depends on economic strength at home, and a nation which can't manage its own affairs properly is not in a position to give advice to those who can. Yeah, yeah. 